Good morning. Great to see everyone here today. We're thankful that you can be a part of this assembly and that we can worship God together and uh, look into his word, study that word together as well. Glad that you can be here. When Paul wrote his first letter to the church in Corinth, he presented them with the simple fact that Christianity stands or falls on whether or not Jesus actually rose from the dead. He was willing to stake the whole of the Christian faith on the reality of one event that took place at a certain time in history. On that one single truth claim, Paul said, our faith stands or it falls. And yet, Today, most people, as we noted a couple of weeks ago, seldom ask the truth question about what they believe. The truth question is simply, is this true or is it not? not uh, the question is not, does this appeal to me? The question is not, do I like it? The question is not, does it suit my preconceived notions of what's good or bad? But the question is, is it true? Out of all the things that people believe in the world, how many do you think ever ask the question, is it true? For example, did Muhammad actually receive a series of revelations from the angel Gabriel, or did he not? Did Joseph Smith actually discover gold plates upon which were written what is now the Book of Mormon, or did he not? Did Siddhartha Gautama Buddha actually attain spiritual enlightenment, Or did he just come to a state of mind that pleased him, that might have been spiritual confusion? True or not true? We need to ask the truth question about whatever it is we believe. You and I need to ask that truth question about the Bible. Is the Bible true or is it not? Did the events recorded in it take place or did they not? Is Jesus the Son of God and Savior of the world or is he not? Did he die on the cross for our sins or did he not? And did he rise from the grave and give us the hope of everlasting life? Or did he not? We need to ask those questions. There have always been efforts to prove the Bible false. There are so many who claim that the Bible is simply a a collection of outdated religious ideas from ancient times and just a bunch of myths. But you know, the reason that I found why people usually claim that is because they don't like what it says. It's not because there's something unbelievable about it. It's because there's something that they don't want to believe about it. This morning, I want to tell you that you should believe the Bible. And I want to offer you some reasons why. We're going to do the same thing next Sunday. Why you should believe the Bible. And before you dismiss what I'm about to say, because I'm a Christian and you think that's what you're naturally going to say, and besides you're a preacher, you're supposed to say that. (laughs) But before you dismiss what I'm about to say on those grounds, before you assume that I've never considered the alternatives, I want to tell you that I have studied the Bible at just about every level one can study it. I've been in informal Bible studies, college dormitory rooms. I've been in graduate seminars in universities. I've studied the Bible with believing professors and with unbelieving professors, even atheistic professors. I've studied in secular university as well as in Christian universities. I've studied in two, the seminaries of two different denominations, one, one of which did not hesitate to say that they thought that much of the things in the Bible were not true. And yet I can clearly and honestly tell you that I have never found any reason not to believe what the Bible says. I've never found any reason not to believe that what the Bible says is true when we properly understand it. So if you're ready to ask the truth question about the Bible, let me give you these reasons why I think you ought to believe it. The first one is because of the history of the Bible. I'm not talking about the history contained in the Bible. I'm talking about the history of the book itself. 
Historians seldom question the reliability of documents from ancient times if they have any uh, reason to accept them whatsoever. For example, uh, Julius Caesar wrote a series of works called the Gallic Wars. And a man by the name of Herodotus wrote an ancient history. And historians today depend a great deal uh, on Caesar's Gallic Wars and the history written by Herodotus. And yet we need to understand that Caesar's book is available in only 10 manuscripts, the earliest of which came a thousand years after the events he describes. Herodotus' history is represented in only eight manuscripts, the earliest of which was written 1,300 years after the events they describe. And yet historians generally do not question the veracity of these books. Now, how does that compare with the New Testament, for example? The New Testament is represented by more than 5,000 manuscripts in the Greek language alone, hundreds more in other languages and other early translations made within just a century or two or three after the time of the events that they describe. Back in 2007, I had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C., to the Freer Gallery of Art because they were putting on a display there, an, an exhibit of Bibles that were written before the year 1000, copies of the Bible that dated before the year 1000. And I, I guess the most amazing thing that I saw on that whole display was a copy of the letters of the Apostle Paul. It was written on parchment, which is very, very fragile. It was, about, it was lying open in the case, and that made it about eight inches wide. It was a small book and about six inches high, and you could clearly read the Greek that, was, that it was written in, and it dated from the year 200. 200. Less than 200 years after the time of Jesus himself. Those letters had already been written. They'd already been gathered into a collection. They were already being uh, distributed among Christians by the year 200. And there it lay for me to look at and to realize what a, what a wealth of evidence we have about our New Testament. Two years later, I was able to go to Manchester, England, and to the John Rylands Library at the University of Manchester, and I went there for one sole reason, because for years I had been hearing about a little piece of papyrus fragment called P52, papyrus 52, about that big. And I'd always heard about it and I wanted to see it. And it's in the, the John Rylands Library at the University of Manchester, and it, it's almost got its own room uh, in a beautiful display case where you can walk around the case and you can see it from both sides. It's hanging there pressed between glass. What's significant about P52? It's the oldest known portion of the New Testament in existence. It was written probably around the year 125, less than a century after the time of Jesus. It has just enough of the text of John 18 on it that you can tell what it is. Our New Testament has this kind of attestation. The vast number of New Testament manuscripts allows for a very close comparison of them to determine what the originals actually said. And the result is that we can be certain of 99.9% .9 that everything in the New Testament has been established, that this is what the writers actually wrote. It is not, as some people will try to tell you, that over, the, over time that things were fabricated, the manuscripts were changed, uh, things were stuck in, things were taken out, all of those other kind of things. There is an unbroken chain of manuscript evidence leading from the earliest second century right on up for hundreds of years to come. I once asked a Muslim imam if they had the same thing for their book. Because he had made the statement that the uh, things that were revealed in the Quran <clears throat> were revealed only to the Prophet Muhammad and that uh, he received the revelations and dictated them to other people who wrote them down on leaves and uh, things of that nature, pieces of wood, and that they no longer existed. And I said, so you don't have a manuscript tradition. You don't have a manuscript history 
for the Quran. You said that the prophet saw, uh, heard these things and gave them and dictated, or dictated, but now they're lost, and so there's no manuscript tradition. And he said, no, there isn't any. That's not what we have for our New Testament. What about for the Old Testament? Well, prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, the oldest manuscripts of the Old Testament dated to about the year A.D. 1000. Now, that's pretty late for events that had happened 2,500 years earlier, A.D. 1000. But those were the earliest manuscripts anybody had. And there was an assumption made by skeptics that over that period of time, from the events themselves and the earliest writings up until those manuscripts in A.D. 1000, that there had to be a lot of what's called textual corruption. There had to be a lot of mistakes. There had to be a lot of changes. There had to be a lot of things that crept in so that the documents that were in existence in A.D. 1000 probably read very, very differently from the originals. Then came the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. And among the Dead Sea Scrolls are manuscripts of every New Testament book except the book of Esther. And those manuscripts dated a thousand years earlier than the ones previously known. And when they were laid side by side and compared with the ones from AD 1000, what they found was that there were hardly any changes at all, almost none in over a thousand years. What did that tell us? That told us that the people who copied them were very, very careful. They were very, very careful because they were all copied by hand. And they took a great deal of pains to put down uh, very carefully the things that they found in writing. Now, none of this proves that the Bible is true, but it does remove the argument that the text of the Bible is hopelessly corrupted and that writings uh, came so much later than the events that they record that they couldn't possibly be accurate. That simply is not the case. By the standards of normal historical study, the Bible stacks up very, very well. You ought to believe it. Another reason why you ought to believe the Bible is because of its honesty. Raise your hand if you've ever tried teaching the story of David to little bitty kids. Yeah. Yeah. You ever notice how much you left out? I noticed when we had vacation Bible school a few years ago and did the life of David, we did not have a David and Bathsheba room. <laughs> you know, there's just parts of the story you don't really want to tell, right? There's parts of the story you don't really want to tell because David's life, in a lot of ways, was not really exemplary. Now, here's a man after God's own heart who was a composer of many psalms, who was an ancestor of the Messiah. Yet he was guilty of adultery and of murder and of the killing of hundreds of people just to cover his own tracks. He killed so many people that God wouldn't let him build the temple. He wanted to build the temple rather than his son Solomon. And God said, no, you've got too much blood on your hands. To build a temple. The Bible is that honest about David's life. Same thing for Moses. Think about Moses' life. He killed the Egyptian. He flatly refused to be Israel's deliverer from bondage when God first told him to go. He just said no. He said, no, I'm not going to go. Send somebody else. Find, find you another messenger, God. I'm not going to do this. He flatly refused. And then when he was in the wilderness with Israel, he criticized God's dealings with the people. He disobeyed God when God told him to speak to a rock so that water would come forth from it. And instead he struck it. And because of that, he wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. Can you imagine that of all people who don't get to go into the promised land? Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. And yet he was the great lawgiver. And yet when God chose two people to stand side by side with his son Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, it was Moses and Elijah. And what about the 12 apostles? They were so slow to grasp Jesus' true identity. They argued repeatedly among themselves about who was the greatest. They wanted to call down fire on people who wouldn't listen to them. And I get that. I get it. It's not a good impulse, but I get it. They wanted to call down fire on the people who wouldn't listen to them. They thought that the women's report of the empty tomb was nonsense. And we could go on and on through the Bible, couldn't we? 
We could talk about Samson and all of, all of his wild doings and all of his excesses. We could talk about Jephthah and that stupid vow that he made. We could talk about Gideon who put God to the test and said, God, show me a sign, and God did. And he said, can you do a better one than that? <laughs> what is this all about? This is all about the fact that the Bible is honest about the people in it. The Bible is honest in telling the story. If I were going to make up a story and just write it and try to persuade people about it, I don't think I would tell people about murderers and, and adulterers and doubters. I think I'd want all the heroes to be heroes. I'd want all the heroes to be perfect. I'd want all the heroes to be ideal. But in the Bible, all the heroes are human. They're all human. And because they are all human, the Bible tells their story the way that it happened. And that's a powerful argument for its truthfulness. Another reason you ought to believe the Bible is because it tells a consistent story. As best we can tell, about 40 different people contributed to the writing of the Bible over a period of almost 2,000 years. And yet they tell a consistent story, a connected story from beginning to end. Now, I doubt that they had any, any Zoom conferences to discuss that. They didn't get their heads together and say, okay, Isaiah, you do this part, and you know. Because God was guiding them in the things that they wrote. The story that they told, the story that they wrote was a connected story. It starts off in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And then humans sinned. And God resolved immediately that he had to do something about that. And you don't get but 11 chapters into the Bible and right at the beginning of chapter 12 and God calls a man by the name of Abraham and says, through your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And he begins working out this plan for the salvation of humanity, the salvation of the whole human race. And then on through the rest of the Old Testament, we read about the prophets who keep reminding the people he's coming. He's coming. Somebody's going to come. A redeemer is going to come. A messiah is going to come. The one God has chosen, the one God has anointed is going to come. We get to the beginning of the New Testament and the Gospels tell us he's here. His name is Jesus. And they tell us the story of his birth and of his life, and of his death, and of his resurrection. And the books that follow that tell us why all that's important and how all of that connected with all that had gone before it. And we're told about all uh, of those things. And then toward the end, we begin to read about the fact that he's coming again. He's coming again to redeem those that he died to save. It's a connected story. It's a connected story, and it's a beautiful story. It's a consistent story. When you get to the four Gospels, people have wondered sometimes, why do we have four? Because they give us four different portraits of Jesus Christ. I have in my library two books by two separate authors that have the same title. The title is Four Gospels, One Jesus. Four Gospels, One Jesus. Because as amazingly different as those four books are, they all tell the same story. They tell it in their own way. Some of them tell parts of the story that others don't tell. But they all tell the same story. They all tell the story about Jesus Christ being the Son of God and the Messiah of Israel. They all tell the story about his teachings. They all tell the story about his miracles. They all tell the story about his death on the cross. They all tell the story about his resurrection from the dead. They all tell the same story. There's an amazing consistency. But somebody might wonder, well, aren't there other Gospels that got excluded from the New Testament that tell a different story? Well, you've probably heard about those, and yes, there were other Gospels. Every now and then, someone in the media points to them as though they were brand new, and they're not. They act as if nobody had ever read them before, and they have. They act as if it's something that has never been discussed before, and it has, as it's never been studied before, and it's been studied over and over and over again. What you need to understand about those other Gospels is they were never excluded from the New Testament. They were never under consideration. 
they were never under consideration. And one reason they were never under consideration is they were all written two to three hundred years after the fact. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all written within less than a century of the birth of Jesus. These books were written hundreds of years later. And here's the main thing about them. They are not gospels at all. The word gospel means good news. We call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the four gospels because they tell the story. They tell the good news about Jesus and about his life and about his death and about his resurrection. These don't tell a story at all. They were written by people who decided under the influence of Greek philosophy that they wanted to change the identity of Jesus. And so they wrote their own gospels, as they call them. But there's no story in them. They don't tell about the cross. They don't tell about the the resurrection of Jesus. They, They don't tell any of that. They just tell about some fictitious Jesus who was some kind of philosopher who was spouting a bunch of nonsense. And as one writer says, these documents were not excluded from the Bible. They excluded themselves. And I'll tell you what I always told my students. Every one of those documents is available online. Go read them for yourself, and you can tell easily, clearly, why they're not in the Bible. They don't deserve a place in the Bible, and you can tell that for yourself. Go read them. They don't contribute to the story. But you should believe the Bible because of the story that it tells. Another reason you should believe the Bible is because of its influence. It amazes me how many people fail to recognize the Bible's positive influence on our culture. But it's really a no-brainer. There was a time not that long ago when biblical principles governed our society. Some of us grew up in that society. And I don't mean by that that everybody was a Christian because not everybody was. And I don't mean that everything was ideal because it wasn't. I don't mean that anything was perfect because nothing was ever perfect. We are all sinners. We always have been. And we always find new ways to mess up. And so things were not perfect. But at the same time, I will tell you without hesitation that things were a lot better. When our society was founded on biblical principles and functioned according to biblical principles, and we had a general agreement among the people of our society that these biblical principles were the way people ought to live, we were a better people. We were a stronger people. But think about it. Now that society, in general, rejects these biblical principles, are we better off? Are we better off? Now, some people will tell you yes, and I have a word of advice for you. Avoid those people. They're dangerous. If they think we are getting better and better, something's wrong with them. Avoid them. We are not better off than we were when we abided by the principles taught in God's word. Besides, even non-believers themselves acknowledge the validity of principles taught in the Bible. How many times have you heard non-believers say, well, people ought to love one another, you know? Where do you suppose they got that? Well, judge not lest you be judged. Where do you suppose they got that? All those principles that they think are valid are gifts to us from God. They are in God's word. Where do they think those things came from? They came from the Bible. Even our judicial and legal system were originally based on the Bible. That's the reason we used to have copies of the Ten Commandments in courtrooms. But at some point, we decided that that was offensive to somebody, and so we'd better take that down. And we don't follow those principles anymore. And our judicial system is breaking down as a result, isn't it? And I'm not talking just because, about because that plaque's not on the wall, but because the principles aren't in people's hearts and not in people's minds. We are not better off. The Bible has always had a positive influence. And who would want to live in a country where all the principles of the Ten Commandments were repudiated? Who would want that kind of society anyway? But you know when it is that we usually realize the value of the Bible's influence? When we've lost it. When we've lost it in our society, that's when we usually start realizing what a great thing it was. 
back in the early 90s, the first time that I had the opportunity to visit the Space Museum in Zhitomir, Ukraine. The founder of the Soviet space program is from Zhitomir, and so they have a, a, a little space museum there. It's not, not large, but the first time we visited it, we had the good fortune of having as a guide a woman named Olga, very intelligent young woman. She was the director of the museum, and she showed us around. We had all the replicas of Sputnik, you know. And some of us remembered Sputnik. I think I saw it fly through my room one night when I was a kid. <laughs> We all remembered Sputnik, you know, and they showed us the replicas of the old space capsules, and you thought, how did anybody ever go to space in those things and survive? <laughs> and she showed us all of that, and it was very, very interesting, and talked about the technology and the developments and how it went from this stage to that stage to the other stage. The whole tour ended in the middle of the building where there was a pool of water about 10 feet long by three or four feet wide, and in the middle of that pool of water, there was a, a plastic dish about this big around. And it had an open Bible on it. And it just floated around in the water. And she took us to that, that little pool of water and she said, this has been placed here to remind us of what happens when you have technology, but you do not have a soul. When you have technology, but you've taken God out of it. She said, we've put this here, so we will never make that mistake again. And I found myself a lot of times wondering, a century from now, could that be us? And lately I've changed that. A decade from now. That could be us. The Bible's influence is a powerful argument for why you ought to believe it. I'm going to give you one final reason why you ought to believe the Bible. That's because you're a sinner. Just like I am, just like all of us, and you're on your way to eternity. It's undeniable. You may not want to think about it, but it's true. And the question is, what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about your sins? What are you going to do about the moment when you stand in the presence of Almighty God who created you and have to give an account for your life? What are you going to do about that? I can just hear someone thinking, but I don't believe any of that doesn't make a bit of difference. It makes no difference at all that you don't believe it. It doesn't change the truthfulness of it. And here's the question. Are you certain enough that you're willing to gamble your eternity on the fact that the Bible is not true? If you're not ready to do that, if you're not that sure that it isn't true, you need to listen. You need a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. You need to follow him. You need to listen to him. You need to put your trust in him. You need to turn away from those things that he says are wrong. Turn away from sin. Repent. You need to confess him. You need to be joined with him in baptism to become his follower, to become God's child. You need to live with him throughout the rest of your life so that when eternity comes, you will live with him for all eternity. Should you believe the Bible, you answer that for yourself. And if you're ready to believe what it says and follow him, we're ready to help you. Come and tell us. Let's stand together and sing. Kneel at the cross, Christ.